and welcome to the Brazil Expat Journal, the BJ you can trust. My name's Phil and I'll be your guide as we explore South America's biggest country. Today we're going to talk to Renee Adolfi, also known as Pandata Prem. She's an expat from Brooklyn, New York with a background in psychotherapy. When she arrived in Brazil, however, she discovered Tantra. Today she lives in a Buddhist temple and works as a Tantra specialist, helping individuals and couples to better their relationships and sex lives. Her work and life have been featured on Matter of Fact, hosted by Soledad O'Brien, and she was a guest Tantra specialist on the Lifetime Channel show Married at First Sight. We'll get into her journey, what exactly Tantra is, and the unique aspects of dating in Brazil. Of course, she'll also play the expat quiz. But first, a little bit of news. By the time this is posted, Sao Paulo should be partially out of quarantine as it enters phase two of its plan to get back to normalcy. On Wednesday, June 10th, street commerce resumed, but with limited hours between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. The shopping malls reopened on Thursday, June 11th with restricted hours. Other establishments such as real estate agencies are also allowed to operate on limited schedules. Let's see how this reopening affects the city, which has around 9,500 deaths due to COVID-19 and 150,000 confirmed cases thus far. In personal news, I've begun selecting songs for my Fall Hall playlist to post on Patreon and hope to have it all finished by next Friday, so look out for that. I posted my first mini BJ about Festa Junina and since YouTube didn't allow the first version of the video to go up with music, I'm taking the music elsewhere. I also began a BJ Facebook page. If you type in the Brazil Expat Journal Facebook on Google, it should direct you there. But I'll also drop a link in the description. And finally, I have an email address, brazilexpatjournal at gmail.com. So if you want to contact me directly about some cool Brazilian things I should look out for and do a show on, or if you have an interesting story or interesting person that you think I should interview, drop me a line. And as always, I want to say thank you to everyone who subscribed to the channel and supported my work, and I want to welcome in any new listeners. This is a very young channel, but the activity has been really great so far. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and always hit that little notification bell to know when new episodes go up. And if you want to support my work, head over to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash philray, or click on the links in the description. Your contribution helps a lot. So now let's get on with the show. Hey guys, welcome back. It's Phil, and today I have a really special guest on the show. Her name is Renee, also known as Prandara Prem, which I've been practicing saying that name. It's a beautiful name. And, and she is here today to talk to us a little bit about Brazilian dating, Brazilian sexuality, because she works in this business. She works with Tantra. So buckle in. It's going to be a really nice talk. A bit adult in some parts, so just be aware of that. And... Is she on? Where is Renee? I'm here. Oh, hi, Renee. <laughs> Hello. And so everybody knows this is our second attempt at recording because I had the bright idea of doing it in the morning. And as we all know, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> and I'm not either. <laughs> yeah, but we're trying. I think we're going to have a really good time. We're going to have a really good talk. So I want to begin by asking you, Renee, where are you originally from? Mm. So originally I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Okay, Brooklyn in the York. house. Yes. Yeah, but I did I did move to Florida um, as an adolescent. Uh, I went to high school there. Then I moved to the D.C. area. So that was the last place that I lived. Oh, cool. Before living here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And the type of work that you do now with Tantra, is that something that you started in the U.S. or something that you started here in Brazil? No, no, I started here in Brazil. So in, so in the U.S., I was a psychotherapist, still am a psychotherapist, right, and had a private practice and all that jazz. And I decided to close down my private practice to travel a bit and just kind of work on me, honestly. And so when I came to Brazil is when I actually found Tantra. 
um, just because doing work on, on relationships, doing relationship healing, I found that to work on myself. And then I just loved it so much. I lived in a Tantra commune for two years and then I decided to, to get certified and become a Tantra therapist. And now I work predominantly with that, um, oh, cool. as well as, you know, doing traditional psychotherapy to talk therapy as well. And we'll get into exactly what Tantra is and all of this stuff in a little bit. But before that, so you were in the U.S. I see here that you studied everywhere. You, you were at uh, Florida State, Marymount University. So you traveled mm -hmm. about a bit in the U.S. And when is it that Brazil became part of your... Um, of your plans? When did it come onto your radar? You know, so I guess, you know, when I hear you say that, I'm like, I guess I've always been a nomad. <laughs> so, um, Brazil, interesting thing was never really on my radar. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, I went to Florida state cause I lived in Florida for a bit. So that's where I went to, to, to college and then grad school. I had already moved, I moved to the DC area. And then after a year, I decided to go to grad school and I just stayed in the DC area for that. And I went to school in Virginia. And then after working for about 10 years as a psychotherapist, I decided to, you know, just do a sabbatical. I had read the book, Eat, Pray, Love. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do my Eat, Pray, Love journey. But how I wanted to do it was three months in India and then nine months in Argentina. And that would have been my year. And a good friend of mine was like, Argentina, why are you going to Argentina? And I was like, because I want to study Spanish. Like, you know, I have so many clients that speak Spanish and, you know, I got to translate. And she was like, go to Brazil. And I'm like, Brazil? Yeah, but I want to learn Spanish. She was like, yeah, Argentina, there's no one there that looks like you. <laughs> She's like, go to Brazil, Salvador. The culture's great. People look like you. You're going to love it. The food is great. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And so, you know, I went to Argentina and um, she was going to Brazil just before carnival. And I was like, she was like, come on, meet me in Brazil, meet me in Brazil. So I was like, all right. And then I had never heard of Salvador, like literally never heard of Salvador, only heard of Rio. And so I'm like, well, if I go to Brazil, I would want to go to Rio, but she's in Salvador. So I'm like, okay. So I go to Salvador to meet her. And she was right. I absolutely loved it. When we was were this, Renee? When was this? This was... This was in 2011. Oh, very recent. Okay. Yeah. And we, it was supposed to be for two weeks. She left and I literally stayed. Um, I had my backpack and everything where I was staying in, in Argentina. I called and I was like, I'm not coming back. Can you mail me my, my backpack? <laughs> and I literally just stayed. And I didn't, have, I didn't go back to the States for two years after that. So... I, so uh, 2011, 12, 13 was when I went back to the States since living in Brazil, um, because I had already closed down my private practice, everything. So it was just kind of easy to stay. So pretty much all the things that she said you would love are the reasons that you stayed. Yes. Oh, cool. Yes. And not to mention the men were beautiful. <laughs> so that helped. <laughs> it helps a lot. It helps a lot. Uh, yes. The and people were beautiful. <laughs> And yeah. so when did the Tantra um, get into your radar then? When did that become something for you? Um, well, actually, I'm sorry. Before you go on, explain to people a little bit what Tantra is, because I'm not sure everybody actually knows. Okay. Um, so Tantra is a philosophy, is a way of life, which is all about expansion. And so many religions come from the Vedic philosophy, and they they repress the sexual energy. So it's like, oh, you you can't have sex because you're going to hell. Um, it's just for procreation, only when you're married. Tantra came about, honestly, it was actually even before all of that. Tantra is about you can have a spiritual life. You can reach enlightenment and still have sex. Like there's nothing wrong with sex. As a matter of fact, um, you can have conscious sex and work with sexual energy and have like amazing orgasms where you're connected to God, you know? And so, and it's not, you know, and I'm, I'm saying sex, you could have sex, but Tantra is much more than that. It's, it's a way of learning to 
work with the sexual energy, which is not having sex, but that divine energy that's within us. We all come from sex, right? We were born because Mm -hmm. our parents have sex. And so we come from sexual energy. So it's learning how to just work with that sexual energy, which is our life force that helps us to manifest different things to actually do what we want to do in life. Um, it's our creative energy. It helps us to write music, to do make music, um, anything that you want. So we learn how to channel that energy and how to, in a sense, become be- better people. And it's because it's all about love. It's all about expansion, expanding your consciousness, expanding your awareness, and having loving relationships with everything and everyone. And originally, this is a philosophy that's coming from more Eastern religions, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. that's interesting so, because in a lot of their creation myths, there are a lot of mother-father figures and in sex involved, mm-hmm. you know, cosmic sex to create the universe. So it's cool. It's kind of you're taking that energy and putting it into yourself. You mentioned yeah. how it goes beyond sex, which is mm-hmm. cool because I I never um, heard that aspect of it before. Um, how exactly can you transform that energy into something that goes beyond just the sex? Yeah. So, you know, today, a lot of people, all they hear is tantric sex, tantric sex, tantric sex. So people get into it because that's what they want to, to do, right? I want to be a better lover. And, um, and then when people take my courses, they see that it's way beyond that. What I'm teaching is breath work. And so when we're working with, with Tantra, you have to be conscious. You have to be present, which means going through different meditations, working on your breath work. And so when you do that, yes, you become a greater lover because you're present in your body as opposed to going to the places, going in the fantasy world, different, thinking about different things. But at the same time, you're present in the world. So when you're present, you can actually hear when your friends, your family, or your partner, or your lover is talking to you and you connect to them, you, you actually learn how to want to connect with your partner for not just having sex. So many of us do things with an end goal in mind, and Tantra is about no end goal. So if you and I are together, for example, it's just about being present, listening to you, hearing you, seeing what you want, seeing what you enjoy, touching you, which Brazilians are really good at, the whole touching, you know. Oh, we're going to and- talk all about <laughs> Brazilians and dating and all that stuff. Now, going back then to the original mm-hmm. question, which is how is it that you got involved with that here in Brazil? Yeah, so it's interesting because when I lived in Salvador, I... um you know, I was working as a psychotherapist and I'm a Reiki master as well, which is I do energy work, hands on healing. And I had my my office. Um, and so because I had my space where I would do workshops, I would do Reiki courses, I would do my 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 sessions. I had a friend who said, oh, I have someone who's coming to Salvador and she wants to do a six week Tantra course. Can she use your space? I was like, yeah, of course. I didn't know what it was at that time. Mm -hmm. This was in 2012. So I was like, sure, she can. So by using my space and doing this six week um, workshop, obviously I did it too. Um, And it was just great. I was like, oh my God, like we didn't talk about tantric sex at all. It was tantric yoga, these different movements, these meditations. And I actually felt connected to my body. Um, because there was a big disconnect between me and my feelings and my body. And so this was one of the first times that I connected and I was like, wow, this is really good. And um, she didn't live here in Brazil. So she left and I was like, oh my God, I want to continue this. And I couldn't find anyone else who, who did that. And then maybe a year later, 2013, I found another lady somehow who was offering a Tantra course for modules. I did the first module and then I don't know what happened. She never finished the other three modules. And so I was like, damn. And so, um, I loved it. It was good. And I, and I was, I started actually bringing this into my work, doing what I had learned from the first module, um, with my Reiki healing, I just started doing massage and kind of started 
developing on my own. And then I got some books and started reading on my own. And then in 2014, I was studying shamanism in Sao Paulo. And so in this course in Sao Paulo, I was kind of like in the interior, like what do you call the interior? The interior, um, the countryside. The countryside of Sao Paulo, Maripurã. Mm-hmm. And there was a lady there who worked with Tantra. There was two ladies there who also worked with Tantra. And they told me about this commune in Minas Gerais. And I was like, oh my God, I must go. And so literally I like closed, got, you know, turned back my apartment, turned handed in my apartment, um, packed my stuff. And I went to this commune and I lived there <laughs> for two years. Wow. It wasn't the plan to live there. It was just to go there, um, be there for three months. Cause maximum you could stay was three months mm-hmm. and just doing tantric meditation, tantric massage, tantric yoga daily. But then they invited me to stay longer and work there. Um, so then I started working, um, translating everything from English to, from Portuguese to English, which was really great. Cause I got to really learn a lot. Like they had so many articles on Tantra that I was translating from Portuguese to English. And so then I decided, okay, I'm going to do the course. Like I already know everything now then did all this translating. So I did the course, um, which was also four modules. So that was four months. And I did it and continued living there. And I then I had my Tantra initiation, which is how I received the name Prandata Prim. And that's a Sanskrit name, mm-hmm. which means to go with the flow of love and life. And I was like, this is so me. I'm going with the flow of love and life. You know, my life has been that. That's yeah. a really awesome story. Very different story. Did you ha- have any Portuguese in you before this? How did you communicate with these people? Oh, yeah. By this time, I had already learned Portuguese. Oh, I got you. Did you study mm-hmm. here or did you... Uh... Oh, I, I learned um, on the streets talking to people. So literally, when I, when I went to... I, when I came to Brazil for the first time in 2011, obviously, I didn't know any Portuguese, never studied it because Brazil was not on my radar. And I had been studying Spanish and I had already been living in Argentina some time. So that helped me. So when I came here, I could actually understand a few things people would say. I think I would understand enough that I could kind of figure out what they were saying. And then I would I would literally speak to them in Spanish because that was the closest language. And I found that a lot of people understood what I was saying in Spanish. So then eventually it became Portanol, you know, that mixture yes. of Portuguese and in Spanish. Yeah. And then within two years, I did um, I did do a course here in Brazil, transpersonal psychology, a postgraduate course. Um, this was before Brazil. In 2013, 2012, I think I started. Yeah, I noticed yeah, that was, you did go to the uh, Federal University of Bahia. I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, but, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll ask about that in a second because I think it's interesting. I think you're one of the first expats on the show that have studied here in Brazil. So I want to ask about that. But mm-hmm. uh, so your Portuguese journey, how long do you think before you felt comfortable with the Portuguese? Honestly, um, maybe good two years. Cool. Yeah, it took a while, two years. Um now, again, within my first two years, I started studying, and it was mm-hmm. all in Portuguese. Mm-hmm. So that was some, like, that was difficult. But it also forced me to kind of have to, I didn't have a lot of um, expat friends at that time. So I was, I had a boyfriend at the time that I was living with who didn't speak any English. So I was kind of forced to learn Portuguese. And... um because I was around people who didn't speak English. And then I was taking a course in, in, in Portuguese, you know, studying in Portuguese. So it just kind of made me like have to, I had to read in Portuguese. It, it I had to like- the best thing for you. Yeah, it was, it was, it was. Um, I think it was even, it was better than just going to school to study Portuguese. Yeah. Cause I was studying in my field, you know, learning um, terminology about psychology uh, counseling and, and these different things. So it was amazing. It was awesome. Yeah. Guys, something very important. And there, I just did an interview with a fellow from England and also Alisa's interview, which is up on YouTube. You guys can check out. 
And one thing that's so important is learning the language and it really opens up your avenues when you come to Brazil. Brazil becomes a different place after you learn the mm. language. Opportunities come up, networking comes up, adventures come up. So Alisa, you know Alisa Renee, right? Um, yeah. And something she said that stuck with me is how one of the lessons that she learned or one of the biggest advice that she could give to someone who's traveling, not just to Brazil, but anywhere, is don't go there and try to be American or try to be English or, you know, don't, right. don't be what you were before. Go into that place, immerse yourself, try to really live as somebody from that country. And I think you have, uh, you open up way more pathways for yourself like you did. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think of, well... I take that back because Brazil does have a few more spiritual kind of, some people like to call them hippie communities, but it's not the first thing you think of when you think of Brazil is a spiritual journey. But how easy was it for you to find these different spiritual paths, um, these courses, in Salvador, or or did you have to move out of Salvador? How how was that process? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's interesting. So when people think about Brazil, yeah, they don't think about that the spirituality because I think it depends on where you are. But Brazil is so spiritual, and so specifically Salvador. Well, not even specifically Salvador. So when you really think about it, all of Brazil, honestly, um, well, because I actually country, entered right? mainly Catholic. Huh? Mainly yeah, it's a man. It's mainly Catholic, but again, the Catholicism was a is large in part a um, what do you call that? It's a cover because a lot of people mm -hmm. are very much into Candomblé, Umbanda, and so they synchronize the saints with the the deities, mm -hmm. the Orishas, and so. I entered, and so I think one of my things is because I'm spiritual, maybe I found this more. And so when I entered, a whole nother story, I actually took a boat from Colombia to Manaus in Brazil. So that's how I entered. I didn't come by plane. And, um, and you know, and, and I'm going to take a step back to what Elisa was saying, and I completely agreed with everything. I don't do the traditional, like, coming in as an American wherever I go. I've traveled the world over, and I'm always with locals. Like, I don't do the touristy things. I don't go on tours. I've never have. I've always wanted to meet locals and hang out with locals and, and, and do traditional things. And so this is how I got to Brazil, taking the boat from Colombia, Leticia, to, to Manaus. And because I was around locals and not even not doing like, you know, hostels and all of that, I found a lot of spirituality in terms of ayahuasca, doing plant medicine and all of those different things. Manaus is in the Amazon, for those who don't know, of Brazil. And so that was my first point of entry. And I stayed there for some time. Then I got to Salvador. And again, I wasn't like about doing the touristy things. I don't think I even... Three years I hadn't done, hadn't gone, I had been to Rio a couple of times, didn't even go to the Christ statue, Sugarloaf Mountain, like nothing. I was doing all local things. And it wasn't until people started coming to visit me and they wanted to do the touristy things that I would take them. So because of that, I found a lot of the spirituality. And so with Salvador, man, I've done so many different shamanic work. Um, I've been to Umbanda ceremonies condom lay ceremonies, really getting to learn about the spirituality and how everything is connected to spirituality from the different foods and the histories behind the different foods. Like, you know, and like moqueca, which you don't have that. That's not common in, in Rio de Janeiro. And I don't know if it's common in Sao Paulo or not where you live. Mm -hmm. um, but that was one of the big things that made me stay here. And it's very like synchronicities would happen. It was it, Brazil, such a magical place. And so, you know, if you think about it, the Brazilians, the indigenous the original people are very spiritual. They're, they work a lot with nature, the elements, plant medicine. But it wasn't until colonization came and Catholicism was brought here and so there's a lot of people who say they're Catholic, but at home they have other practices. You know, they're still practicing the condom lay 
or, you know, the Umbanda and, and the native religions. But yeah. then, yes, you have your other part where there's a lot of people who's also like, oh, that's evil, condom lay, and, you know, like anywhere in the world. But this is why so many people practice it hidden. In secret. You know? In secret. In secret. Yeah. Yeah. This is something interesting about Brazilian cultures. The mixing, not obviously we're talking about the religious, but of everything is a little mm -hmm. bit of, of a mix. And I'll tell you something, Renee. When I was little, my mom is, or was, she passed away, but she's was an evangelical, you know, regular old mm -hmm. Baptist when we eventually made it to the U.S. But it's funny how those little things never left her. Probably something that she learned from her great, great, great grandmother that's been passed down is that she would put a little glass of water with a candle next to it or some uh, on top of the fridge. And I would never understood mm -hmm. this. And then only later when I started to learn a little bit more about my own culture, because for those that mm -hmm. don't know, I was born in Brazil, but raised in the U.S., but I never connected to my Brazilian culture until later in life. So when I got to that phase where I wanted to connect to Brazilian culture, I started to ask and I'd ask my sister and, and things like that. And they're like, well, no, this stuff all comes from traditions outside, obviously, of Christian uh, tradition, because mm -hmm. Christians mm -hmm. aren't burning candles. <laughs> right. Evangelical Christians aren't, you know, and that's what she would do. She would uh, write something on a piece of paper, put it in a glass of water, kind of pray over it, put a little candle next to it. And she even made some connections to Jews because uh, up in Recife, there were a lot of Sephardic Jews that mm -hmm. ran away during the Inquisition. And obviously they would too have to do all their stuff in secret. So Jews also light a lot of candles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my sister, mm -hmm. who eventually became an Orthodox Jew, said maybe there's even a connection to that. Uh, uh, and this is up in Recife that my, my mom's mm -hmm. from. So that's cool. And then, but yeah. Eastern religion... It's all connected, mm -hmm. and the, the water really represents, the water is a, a medium to connect with our ancestors, spirit guides, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's why if you, you, you go to, all, all of the elements have a specific purpose, <laughs> yes. but when you're doing prayers and you're lighting a candle, you got the fire element, um, and so, you know, it, you know, it's just to, to, to help bring more energy to whatever prayers you're having and, you know, connect to that other world to help make sure, you know. Um, and how strong was the Eastern religion influence here in Brazil when you first got here? Was it already established or is it something that grew? The Eastern? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think that's something um, that's too, too common here. Um, I think it's something that's been growing like it is as well in the U.S. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I'm living in a Buddhist temple right now, <laughs> working with Tantra from India and is very big in, um, in Thailand as well. So it's just so interesting. All of this, um, Eastern attraction. <laughs> yeah, Eastern it's something that I've, I've noticed has grown since I've been here. By the way, are you still in Salvador? No, I'm in Rio. Oh, uh, you're in Rio. Okay. And why did you end up in Rio? Honestly, because with my work, I just make more money in Rio than Salvador. <laughs> I prefer Salvador. I absolutely love Salvador. Um, but the thing is, in Salvador, there's not as much opportunity for people to work and make money. And so when I was there, you know, a lot of times people would be like, oh, can we do an exchange? Can we do an exchange? which I, I'm fine with doing exchanges, but then I'm not making any money and I can't pay my, pay my bills. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I need to be able to charge and make, and then I can also do exchanges. So here in Rio, you have, there's more people who have opportunities just like in Sao Paulo as well. They have um, more opportunities in terms of finances and work. And, and so they can invest more in, in self care. And then I kind of found that Rio is a, is, is a, is great it's a great location for me because I can easily work in all three states. So I have clients in Sao Paulo and it's a matter of taking a, a plane 45 minutes and I'm in Sao Paulo, or I can take the overnight bus, be there in six hours, sleep on the bus, get up and work a whole day and come back to Rio. And then I fly to um, Salvador. I usually fly to Salvador once every two months or so 
to see clients there. So um, this has made it easy where I can work and be in Sao Paulo, Rio, and, and Salvador. Cool. Yeah, and guys, if you don't get the geographies, because Rio is right in the middle uh, between Sao Paulo and Salvador. And you've been really successful with this. And before we mm -hmm. go on, let me just uh, plug some of your co uh, ways to contact you. We have uh, her Facebook and Twitter, guys. It's at Renee Adolfi. Okay, and she's got her Instagram, Pandara. Prem. Mm -hmm. I, I was practicing how to say that for a very <laughs> and long time. Great, right. it's perfect. Yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> name, beautiful name. And then you guys, you can check her out on Patreon uh, slash Prandata uh, Prem. And on her Patreon, she's got some special courses set up, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Some of the stuff that you have on Patreon, and she's got her website PrandataPrem.com, and on YouTube where you can see a bunch of videos. She does a bunch of live videos. I don't know how she does this many live videos. <laughs> She's always on Facebook doing, uh, I'm sorry, on YouTube doing something. And I was so honored that you invited me to be on one of your episodes because you became like immediately one of my favorite uh, YouTube <laughs> characters. And then she invited me on. We were talking a little bit about polygamy and monogamy and things like that, which leads me to, do you see that segue? Hey, great. <laughs> You're perfect. I got to learn from you. <laughs> Which leads me to uh, what we do want to touch on today. It's dating and relation relationships. And what's the difference when you come from outside and what you're going to expect and get when you're down here in Brazil. And Brazil is a big country. So obviously, Certain regions have their own peculiarities, but we're going to keep it more or less general. Maybe later, mm -hmm. if we want to talk about some differences between the Northeast, the South of the country, the middle of the country, we could do that. But first thing I want to ask you right off the bat, uh, Renee, is what is the best way to approach a Brazilian if you have that second interest, which is, hey, I want to get to know you, I want to go out with you, what is the best way to approach Brazilians? Because they're very friendly to begin with. Yeah, they're very friendly. <laughs> so one of the things that I found um, is interesting. So when I first got here, I didn't, I never knew who was interested in me or what. I, just, I thought everybody was interested in me, honestly. I was like, yes. people are touching me and they're friendly. And I'm like, oh, does he like me? You know? Yeah. So one of the things that I found that Brazilians are, they're not so straightforward like Americans can be, right? Um, and so you have to kind of really be um, subtle, flirt flirtatious. Um, I think that if you're like, if you're like, oh, I really like you and you come on really strong, that's going to kind of turn them off, in my experience. So I don't know what other people have experienced, in my experience, and what I've seen with, you know, some of my friends. I agree with so you. I think it's a, okay, so I think it's like a subtle way of being nice, being friendly, and then asking more questions because you're showing your interest. Oh, and one of the things that I learned, so, you know, they give you the kiss on the cheek, and so when you're not interested and you just, they give you the kiss on the cheek, but when you're interested and you give that kiss, you do it a little bit closer to the lips. So almost kind of like right at that, that crack of the, the lips, you know, right there. And then it's like, oh, this person is interested in me. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's doing that when you kiss. Um, they're very touchy-feely. So I can't even say touch more because that's something we would do in a state. Touch more, then they'll know. But they're already very touchy feeling and touchy all the time. But I would say asking questions, asking more questions so that they know that you're you're interested and then talking more about yourself and, and what you want and really wanting to listen to them. And then a lot of times, like just, you know, um getting into what you like and hinting at, like, you know, hinting at, oh, I love the beach or I love this kind of food, so they can ask you to go there, you know, but not you um, saying, hey, let's go to the beach or let's go to dinner, you know, especially if you're a woman. Um, but um, I think what I've noticed a lot of times, a beach might be a good kind of first date. A lot of people might go to the beach the first time or to a local bar and have drinks. So a lot of times I'll be like, oh, you know, you want to go to this bar and have a drink? 
and um i i noticed that the, here it's a lot more informal the first dates which is nice mm -hmm. too. the your wallet thanks you too at the end yeah because brazil is an outside country it's a tropical country for the most part mm -hmm. unless you go way south so right people are more app to or they're more open to just going to the beach going to the local luncheonette or the local barzine as we call it here the little bar just having mm -hmm. a drink and getting to know you and it's not gonna be like oh what a cheapskate <laughs> right you right know, now and i do have to say um I know we were talking in general, but but I started here in Salvador. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I noticed in Salvador, it was a little bit more intense than what I'm saying now. Mm -hmm. Because you would go out and meet someone. Um, and I haven't noticed that again in Salvador or Sao Paulo. Um, but in Salvador, I would go out and I would meet someone. And then it was an immediate. They were like, we're talking. And the next thing you know, their tongue is down my throat. And I'm like, okay, so I guess that means they're interested. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You know something? I had an experience with a few Bayanos, and I, yeah, it's a little hotter. And, it's a little hotter. <laughs> and I think you can sort of just measure the temperature by the real temperature outside. The, right. I've kind of been with people from as far, you know, super south all the way up to the north. And yeah, mm -hmm. the further north Not you so get, it's a little bit more feverish. And yes. you have to, yeah. you have to set your boundaries. You got to be you ready do, to set you do. your boundaries because they're ready to go. Yes. And the thing is what I know, because that's what my first point of entry. And so I was just so confused because you know how you would do the little, you're talking, you look into each other's eyes and then you kind of slowly lean forward. And so, you know, the kiss is happening, but there you didn't know. And it was like, Ooh, so I kind of had to like always be prepared when I'm talking to a guy for that to just kind of happen for me to, you know, put my hand and, and push back just in case. Um, and then a lot of times in the North, you know, in the Northeast, they're like, you know, you just meet and they're like, oh, let's go to a hotel. And so it was interesting the first time I went to Sao Paulo within my first year and I met a guy, he actually didn't do all of that. And he mm -hmm. actually opened my car door, took me to a restaurant, paid. And I was like, whoa, this is different than what I experienced in Salvador. I like this. This is kind of more of like what I'm used to, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so you can see those differences based between, you know, where you live within Brazil, you know? No, I get you. And Renee, is there a point where this becomes a bit uncomfortable? Uh, you know, where's the division line between, okay, this is just a tropical hot culture and wait, these men need to know how to act. Yeah. So, you know, each person is different. Um, for me, I don't generally feel uncomfortable. Um, but again, I don't have really, I don't really, you know, I'm, I'm so kind of free and open sexually that I'm okay. And I'm, um, I'm very good at, you know, expressing myself like, no, I'm not interested. But there are a lot of women or, or men as well who might feel uncomfortable with this, you know, um, with people being moving a lot quicker in that sense or being quick to, to, to kiss. And so, you know, it really depends on, on the person. Um, I, I generally feel okay. Whereas I've had, you know, and I, I have, I've had men, you know, and I'm walking and with stranger like, Oh my God, you're beautiful. And I'm like, thank you. And, but I've had friends who felt uncomfortable with that. Um, you know, and for me, I take it as they're genuinely noticing my beauty and I'm okay with that. And I'm like, thank you. I see someone who looks good too. I'm like, Oh, you're beautiful. Oh, you're handsome. Oh my God, you're fine. You know? And I'll tell people that too, but I'm not, I'm not wanting anything more. And so I'm just generally like expressing that you're beautiful. And, um, and I've had people do that and the guys who have said that and they haven't tried anything else. So I'm like, okay, I appreciate that. Thank you for, for, you know, noticing that. Um, and I don't personally take it as, oh, you're only demeaning me. You're only looking at my, my beauty. You're not mm -hmm. noticing my intelligence or anything like that. Because that's all they have to see is my physical. So I don't get up 
into all of that, like, oh, you know, you're just, you know, demeaning me, bringing me, breaking me down to just a sex object. That's just not the way I think, but people do feel that way. And, and that's okay. So those people might have more of a difficult time with that. And so it's just, you know, kind of prepare yourself. Yeah. Prepare yourself. And, um, but at the same time, know your limitations, know who you are. I I think like for me, for example, I'm slow as hell. I'm super slow. And I met a girl about maybe two, three years ago who she was ready to kiss. Like I had just met her for like an hour, maybe two. And I met her. It was very formal in the sense that, you know, a friend of mine invited her to meet me and we got to talk and we liked each other. I walked her to the metro station. This is in Sao Paulo. And I guess now that I think about it, she asked me something that kind of intimated that she wanted me to kiss her right then and there. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. I just met you. But then I understood, you know, I asked a few Brazilian friends like, oh, she's been really cold <laughs> since. And they're like, oh no, you should have definitely kissed her. And I, and from a, from an American perspective, we're thinking, wait, we usually, I mean, if we really, wait three really like somebody, maybe on the third date, I mean, if we're just going right. out for a one night stand, yeah, I mean, everything everything's mm-hmm. on the table but if we're getting to know somebody it's going to take us a little bit longer to go to that step of oh i want to kiss you romantically so that's definitely different which leads me to this question which that's one thing to look out for is there anything else that a foreigner should look out for when uh, a brazilian is flirting with them that you can think of hmm because we definitely got the proximity. That's one thing that's for me is yeah. definitely shocking. They will stand a few win- <clears throat> excuse me, a few inches from your face. Mm-hmm. In general. Yeah. Even when they're not yeah. flirting. So maybe a little bit closer yeah. when they're flirting. <laughs> yeah, a little bit closer when they're flirting. Damn near kissing you. <laughs> um what else? So I was trying to think back. So when I um so when I first got here, oh, they're quick. <clears throat> like you were saying, they they are quick. So you do have to, um, you have to be able to know your limitations, like you said, Phil, your boundaries, and it's important and exert that. Um, but also knowing that it may be a chance that you take that if you if you don't like go with them to their house or hotel that night, you won't hear from them again. Yes. And it's nothing personal, but. Yeah. I think they took it personal. <laughs> and so they, they, like you said, they become cold to you. Um, because it's just, a, a lot of that is also their culture. Um, so like the first guy I ever dated, uh, this was within three months of me being in, in Salvador, just moved. And um, I was doing volunteering at this um, for this agency with kids who were abused. And he was the um, computer teacher and I was doing psychology there and um he asked me out and I went out with him he was like oh you know let's go to oh I play basketball come watch me play get basketball then we can go eat or something so I'm like cool you know all right so he lives he lived about an hour or something from me by bus or whatever I go with him watch him play basketball it doesn't end to like 11 p.m or something and then obviously I'm not able to get back home because again, public transportation is a little dangerous to be going back home that time of the night by yourself or whatever. Um, they didn't have Uber at this time mm-hmm. and shit. I couldn't afford a taxi <laughs> from, <laughs> from there to where I live. He, nice. he set it up nice. He, he set it up nice. And I didn't realize it was going to go on this late. So yes, of course I ended up having to sleep at his place. But I was actually fine with that because we had been working together. So I had a pretty good idea of who he was. And because we were volunteering at the same place, I didn't feel like he would do something. You know, my intuition didn't say he would do anything, but I was also attracted to him. So needless to say that first date, I stayed at his house. Of course, we ended up, you know, having sex and it was great. And then, um, so, you know, and that's kind of like how I think a lot of things just kind of flow there. And then within the two weeks, I had been at his place 
because he had his own place and I was, I had a, I had a room, I had roommates or whatever. So I ended up being at his place like three times out of the week. And then I think within a month I was living with him within a month. So we were living together. I moved into his place because it was like, oh man, it's so far to go keep going there. Two buses and these long waits and it just kind of happened. And, and I think that's kind of like a normal flow in Brazil because of, you know, they're very much, I think a lot of people end up moving together in relationships quickly on. And then they end up saying that they're married. You know, my last boyfriend here, you know, um, we lived together and everybody was like, you're married. And I'm like, well, no, we're not married. People are like, you're married. Your husband, where's your husband? And so I got to realize as soon as you're living together, you're married. Yes, so, yes. so I've been married a couple times here in Brazil. <laughs> I know. This is something funny, guys. And, and again, you just have to get it used to it and just realize it's a different culture um, that here it's the casamento. You know, I, I was actually talking to a buddy uh, two days ago and he was like, oh, I've been married four times. But then I had to actually ask him, okay, is this like actual marriage marriage or contract you know sign the paper marriage mm-hmm. and it's like oh no sign the paper marriage only twice but the other two is just because we were living together and it's so weird to me to hear that, that yeah it I, is I've it been is married because i'm like i meet these very young people they're 24 25 26 like oh já fui casado já fui casado i'm like how the hell were you married like three right. times in your life <laughs> and I think, and it's interesting, I think that comes from the shame and the stigma of, of having sex before married that was brought to, brought here by Catholicism, Christianity. Mm-hmm. And so you're living to, so, you're living together, you know, it's like, oh my God, you're living in sin. You're not married. So naturally they just started saying, oh yeah, we're married to kind of, you know, you don't know whether they're legally married or not, but they're married. And that gets rid of that stigma of, ooh, people looking at you and like you're married, you're living together, you know? So I think That's that was just another way of adopting that that kind of protection, you That's know, from that shame and that guilt. Okay, cool. I, I never thought of it that way. That's an interesting way to think about it. And uh, also with the quickness uh, for any of you guys, because we're really trying to focus more on the dating side, but later, Renee, I do want to talk to you about relationships, maybe on another episode. But you got to be, well, I don't want to say be careful because that sounds negative, but just be aware that mm-hmm. you can go from meeting somebody one night and being their boyfriend, girlfriend the next night and then meeting their uh, parents Damn. the next and the sagras, the mother in laws, and It can be shocking. And this happened to me, Renee knows, because I talked to her about this, how this happened to me last year, and it caught me by surprise. And I've been here for 10 years. Uh, And it still caught me by surprise where I met someone, and before you know it, he was at my house, and before you know it, he wasn't leaving my house. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. And as though I liked him, but it created this conflict between us because I wasn't I wasn't uh, on that vibration. I wasn't on that Brazilian vibration at the moment. Mm where I was ready to accept that. I think this happened to me before when I first got to Brazil, but I was on a much more Brazilian vibration where I let it flow. This Mm -hmm. one, I was like, no, I'm not on that vibration. And it was frustrating. We eventually uh, separated. But it's for him, it was just natural. It's like, wait, Mm -hmm. this is just what's supposed to happen. You brought me to your house, you know, and we like each other. Why would I leave? You're not telling me to leave. So it's like, right. um, So you have to be careful with that because it happens fast. I want to just move on to one more thing before we jump into something else. And that's gender roles in the dating game, in the flirtation game. Is it similar to what um, people would expect? You know, most of our audience is coming from either North America or Europe, which is more or less a similar culture. Uh, Is it much different down here, the gender roles or not? You know, do the girls come up to the guys? Do the guys come up to the girls? How is it like? So that's so interesting. So we live in a very male chauvinistic society here in Brazil, <laughs> still very, a lot of machismo. But I have noticed that women, oh, so it's so interesting. Okay, so 
women actually can be aggressive, but in a different way. So, um, then, then us in a state. So they will let you know, like they will let the man know if they're, they're interested, um, with the way that they flirt and they will be quicker to, to kiss. And so I remember I was interested in a guy one time and it was another girl who was interested and I was kind of like trying to be my traditional self to let him come on and, you know, flirt with me. And, and I, I think the thing is, um, if you try to go too slow, you're going to lose the person. <laughs> so it's like, it's almost like you have to kind of kiss real quick and like making sure you're like engaging in conversation to keep it going so that, um, both of you know, you're feeling each other and, you know, just letting it be known, like talking more about changing the topic to be maybe even more sexual or, you know, make it, you know, so it's clear that you, you both are interested in each other instead of trying to play these games. A lot of times in the States, the women will play these games to have, you know, let the men chase after them. And I shouldn't say play games because in general, you know, men it's like to ritual. kind of chase, it's the <laughs> you know, ritual. And, I mean, the mating ritual. So, yeah. and here is not that mating ritual. I don't, I haven't found it to be so big here. Um, even though there's a lot of machismo. So, um, I think that women, women can as well make it known that they're interested and go after a man or woman and woman, a man and a man. I think that, um, both can, but I think it's, it just has to be a little bit, it's, it, it still is a little different than how we would do it in the States or in Europe. It's well, the women here, the last explain it. Yeah. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I've been here since so nine, and I've noticed that women have slowly but surely, because Brazil's, you know, unfortunately is a little bit behind on some social things, you know, compared to the mm -hmm. rest of the world, but it's catching up, it's catching up, you know, so especially yeah. for blacks, for women. So I have noticed a rise in a lot of women, woman empowerment here, yeah. whereas women will feel like, hey, they can express their sexuality i mean which is weird renee because brazil is already a very sexual country and you know, women are already you know half dressed on tv and on novellas and in real life mm -hmm. but there's a difference between that and a woman actually feeling like okay i'm expressing my sexuality i actually want to show that look i look damn mm -hmm. good and i feel comfortable yeah. in that and in the other, it feels more like, okay, the man prefers that I dress like this. So I guess I'm going to dress like this. So with that, I have noticed a little bit more of women coming up to guys and uh, talking to guys. But I don't think it's as strong as in the U.S. still. I, for me, yeah. it, it's that mm -hmm. uh, I always like to call the bipolarism of Brazil, where it's so extremely liberal in some things and so extremely conservative in, in, in sometimes the exact same thing. It's not like in different areas that it's conservative and liberal. It'll be conservative and liberal about mm -hmm. the same exact thing, which will drive you nuts. Uh, yeah. And so the, I think the woman still has this feeling of like, oh, the man needs to come up and say this and say that and he needs to know how to dance so he can twirl me around and it's it's weird it's very yeah uh, it, i think and it becomes tough for us that are not from here because we don't know exactly what role we should be playing you know should we step right back step right forward <laughs> right yeah that's the challenging thing yeah and 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 brazilians are actually uh, uh, they're actually quite shy as well like you yes. wouldn't think it they're shy extremely. and it's extremely shy so you and you know you think because and, it, and so this is the whole thing it's like a whole ball of contradictories so yes. having this, this conversation i'm like oh my god like what <laughs> what is it so it's like very sexual like you were saying they could be walking around the streets wearing almost nothing and it's okay but then they're shy and it's like, so it's always like a fine line because they'll get offended easily too. So you have to also be very careful with like what you're going to say, mm -hmm. you know, and how you say it. Um, 
Because that's the thing that I've noticed. Like when I'm like, because I'm a very direct person. It's like, okay, I feel something, I say it. But then if I'm so direct, then they get offended. So I learned that you kind of have to go around and be very subtle and kind of like, so, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's just, it's so, so interesting, the dynamics and conversation and everything here. <laughs> well, it's like the waves of the ocean. You got to think of Brazil like that. You know, it's up, it's down and, and it's not impossible. You just have to be just like when you're in the ocean and you just let your body kind of be taken by the water. But at the same time, you got to have a little bit of firm footing on the sand below otherwise the wave's going to take you somewhere you don't want to go so right it's getting that balance of feeling the water flowing but also keeping your feet on some solid ground and that is how you're more or less going to feel out how brazilians are going to be but it's it's a complex i mean we'll definitely we're, we're, we're going to talk a lot about this in future episodes because renee is so cool with this and She's in the know, as we say. She's in the know. <laughs> and this is the light version, guys. This is light. This is this, this is, is light. This, this is the first module. <laughs> <laughs> Get y'all ready. Y'all gotta be prepared to handle, you know, these deep deeper, intense conversations yes. that could happen. <laughs> the, ones, the ones that if you have kids, you may want to put on your earbuds. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, but in general, though, you have you have fun dating over here, right? You have fun flirting with people. Oh, I love it. I love yeah. it. I love it. Um, it really, it definitely. So I, I have to say, being in Brazil will help you to feel better about yourself. Like honestly, um, I remember my niece came here. My niece was sixteen or seventeen at the time. And she just got so much more attention than she's got in the States, you know, like in terms of men, you know, just men, you know, the boys was like, oh, you're so beautiful. And so um, I think because they're so much more open here and you can kind of be OK, you feel better dressing and, you know, wearing the thong bikinis, you know, no matter what size you are. I you know, sometimes too sizes. much, sometimes too much. <laughs> but, you know, it's like. It's great because it just makes you feel good. Like you, you can come into yourself no matter who you are, how you look, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's just it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Like no, I think man. that about I think that about the um, the culture here is how how people are just able to say those things more openly. Like oh, you look good. You look this. You look that. Like I have a little brother. He's well, he's 19 now, but, you know, obviously I've known him for a while. And I always thought it was odd that even in his age group, you know, when he was younger, 15, 16, 17, he'll post a picture of himself on Facebook and it'll be equally the other boys and the other girls will be like, you're lindo, beautiful. Oh, look, it's so good. You, you, this, you, that. I'm like, wow. Imagine, I mean, for us, I mean, I guess... Other women may be able to say it to other women, but another boy, when I was 16, telling me, oh my God, you look so good. Oh, I love your hair. Oh, I love this. It's unheard of. And I think even today in America, uh, it's still something weird to hear another man tell another man this, but they're just flowering each other with love and especially about how they're looking, their physical beauty that if you got low self-esteem and maybe you're ugly, really, <laughs> in reality, <laughs> but you'll mm -hmm. never know it in Brazil. <laughs> right, <laughs> you'll right. You'll never know it. So, you so, never know it. So, and then, and then whatever you perceive as that ugliness starts to fade away, you start to feel so a little bit more confident. You start to feel a little bit more like, oh, I, I got something. I got something going on. And that's the first step to actualizing everything else that you need to actualize in your life is just feeling good about you mm -hmm. which is what renee is all about with her tantra work guys so again reach out to her facebook and twitter at renee adolfi instagram prandata prem and her patreon is patreon slash prandata prem 
and we have our website prandaraprem.com and on YouTube we got Pradama oh sorry Prad, Prad <laughs> oh, I almost had it I was I was right. off the you want to so roll easy. you want to roll uh, <laughs> Prandara Prem or Renee Adolfi you can find her on YouTube and I'll link all this stuff as usual down in the description of the video so that you can easily click on it but it's up there on the screen the whole time too so if you're more of the typing type you can do it that way now renee we get to the part of the show where people get to place their bets to see whether or not renee is a true expat or not because uh -oh. Renee is going to take a quiz oh no i'm so nervous you should be <laughs> okay let's see if i'm a true expat oh lord okay let's see go ahead okay I, I'm, I'm preparing myself okay go ahead uh so 10 questions more or less <laughs> oh, 10 questions more or less. <laughs> <laughs> okay go <laughs> the, the fate of whether or not i actually upload this video depends on how well you answer these questions <laughs> See, I've, oh, got these, I've got a lot of <laughs> obstacles with these. So you take these questions seriously. Uh, 10 yeah. lightning round-ish, you know, uh, lightning round-ish questions. Just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Little music mm -hmm. intro. And here we go. Renee, what is the best thing about Brazil? Food. Food? Give me your favorite food. Moqueca. <laughs> oh, Moqueca is so delicious. So, so delicious. delicious. Uh, have you had Moqueca from Espiritu Santos? I have. So, oh my God. Because that's the big so fight Espiritu here in Brazil. Santos, they say, yes, yeah, they say this is Santos? where it originally comes from and it's the best. Mm -hmm. But I am going to tell you... I felt like it was much better in Bahia, but it was really, 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 really good in Espiritu Santo. Yeah, I like both. Yeah. I've had them both. I've never had it in Bahia, but I had a uh, moqueca in Sao Paulo made from a, like a 78-year-old Bahian. So I'm mm -hmm. guessing I'm getting as close to the original as right. possible. And it's still the best right. moqueca I've had, but I've had one <laughs> in Espiritu Santo, Vitoria Espiritu Santo, which was delicious too. Yeah, they're yeah, they're, they're delicious too. Yes, Sao Paulo has great food too. Rio, the food sucks here in Rio. <laughs> yeah, that's the general consensus. Thing with Sao yes. Paulo guys is that everybody from Brazil comes to Sao Paulo, so you end up getting a little bit of all of Brazil if you are in Sao yeah. Paulo. Okay, number two, what is the worst thing about some about Brazil? Wow. Uh oh, that's hard because I love Brazil so much. The worst. Thing about Brazil. Um, okay, so um, things happen in a whole nother time. So, like, you will, it's just, okay, like, you can schedule, okay, <laughs> forget the time. I'm gonna say, um, and I don't know how it is in Sao Paulo, but in Brazil, what I found, I'll try to, like, do something and I'll send an email to someone and they don't respond. Or I set a time, and then they're like an hour late. <coughs> um, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? And it's like, oh my god! So, for example, when I first got here, and I was in Salvador, and I was trying to like look for work, and I'm doing like what we do in the states: you send an email, I send my resume, nobody's responding, and I'm like, it can't be because my resume is horrible. Like, I mean, you know, so. I decided, okay, I'm gonna go to a couple of these, couple of the schools that I sent my my resume to. I go to the school and they're like, oh, I love this. Can you when can you start? And I'm like, um, did you not get my email? Oh yeah, they didn't get it. Like, <laughs> you know, they just don't open the email. <laughs> or um, you know, I set up an appointment for a Reiki session or whatever at like 10, and then they come at eleven. And I'm like, well, you know, I got another appointment at 11 o'clock. So you just can't be on that kind of American schedule um, living here in Brazil. Because it's like, it ain't going to happen. You're just going to have to adjust and accept zone. that they be on their own time. They be on their own time. Yeah. 
And uh, I met a dude a, a couple months ago who, who's an American, and he told me this happened to him where he was going to his boyfriend's parents' house for shuhasku, a barbecue, and they it said, you know, it's 7 o'clock, I think, or 7 or 8. So he actually showed up at 7. You know, at the time that it said and, on the invitation, and the and dad walks him, out with his doing? underwear, like you know, boxer shorts, whatever, and said, "What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you here? Because <laughs> if you, somebody, if the shuhask was at seven, really it's at eleven. You know, right? Uh, so yeah, you got to get used to the time thing. São Paulo is more or less the same. It's a little bit less. Maybe the hour will be half an hour. Um, but yeah, Sao Paulo's better because Sao Paulo's more of a work district. So people are more on time with things. But like literally here in Rio in Salvador, I will put a time that I know is not really going to start. So I'll, I'll put an hour earlier, hoping that, you know, the hour later it'll get started, you know, so. I feel you. Number three, you already kind of did number three, which is mukaka, which was your favorite food. But you got a second choice. What's a second choice favorite food? Akarajé. Akarajé. <laughs> Akarajé as well. That's really good. It's is that, the like sh- uh, refried beans, the okay. the the ground ground chickpeas. Yeah, like refried chickpeas, grounded, and they fry it. But man, it's so good. With and, hot sauce and, and mm-hmm. lettuce, tomato salad and whatever, shrimp, dried shrimp <laughs> in it. And you, you just have a good time with that. Number oh, yeah. four, what's your least favorite food here? Because mm. there's some nasty stuff. Yes, there are some nasty stuff. Um, that moella. But is moella like chitlins? Because I ain't like chitlins in the oh, state. Oh, yeah, moella. Oh, yeah. Oella? Oh, goodness. Now you're going to make me look it up. But it's not exactly chitlins, but... Whatever that is, it's the I inside. looked at that. Huh? It's like the inside. It's the gastric mill, the ventriculus. <laughs> Ew, I was like, it's you just organ. look at that. I went to a restaurant and I saw that. And I was like, ooh. The gizzard. Ooh. Yeah, it's an organ found in the digestive tract of some animals. So... That would mm. be Moella. I actually like Moella. <laughs> <But I, laughs> well, I have to confess, I've never even tried it, but I looked at it and I was like, before even knowing, I looked at it and I was like, oh no. This is so I never even tried it. And then when I, then when I to- was told what it was, I was like, oh no. And tell us what is your best drink? Could be alcoholic or not. Okay, so I'm going to say Kaipur Vodka. So Kaipurinha <laughs> is the national drink that everybody knows. When you come to Brazil, you got to have that made with cachaça. But I'm not really a cachaça fan. Um, wow. I know. So I do like it and I will drink it. But if I have a choice, I always order it with the vodka. So it's just like caipirinha, but with vodka. So depending on where you are, they call it either caiparosca or caipar- yeah. vodka. Oh, but it's see, the same thing. So you like the caipirosca. Here in Sao Paulo, they call it more the caipirosca. When I first came uh-huh. to, 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 to Brazil, I had a lot of caipiroscas, but then when I discovered the caipirinhas, I was like, oh my goodness. And yeah, the caipirinhas. Yeah, caipirinhas are good too, but I'm a vodka. I'm more of a vodka person, and I think oh, the cachaça. It really depends on which cachaça they're using. That's what I so was gonna if, say. Yeah, yeah. So that's why if I know if I'm having it made at home and it's good quality cachaça, then I will definitely drink a caipirinha and I love it. But when yes. I'm going, you know, certain places and they're using the real cheap ones, it just is not as good. So oh, definitely I'll order no. them. That's yeah, the gasoline. Yeah, the 51. Yeah. Guys, stay away from 51. Although, yeah. I shouldn't talk because I had 51 on Thursday night. I went out. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say this because we're supposed to be socially distancing. But I was a bad boy and I did end up uh, at a friend's house drinking some 51 cachaças. And man, that shit is just like, well, you know, just had a couple. Yeah. Because it is not good stuff. But if you get the really good cachaça, 
which is usually comes from Minas Gerais. Yeah. You know, uh, craft, cachaça. Man, oh man, you're gonna have some good stuff. Tell me, Renee, we're at number six. We're moving right along. What is the best place to visit in Brazil? Or best place you? Oh my god. Brazil? Oh my god, so many. It's mm. that's hard. Can I give you my top three? No, just one. Ah. Uh, <sighs> okay, Chapada Diamantina in Bahia. That's about seven hours from Salvador. Amazing. In the mountains, waterfalls, beautiful hikes, beautiful trails. It's just amazing. Great food, beautiful energy. Love it. It's a place I hear a lot about, so that's a good one mm -hmm. for you to choose. And number seven... What is the most overrated place or thing? You can pick one, two, or do both. Most overrated. In Brazil. Mm -hmm. The most overrated? Mm -hmm. I think... Mm, I don't know. Like, maybe the... Uh, I'm scared to say this, but the party life? <laughs> the party <That's> scene? <laughs> okay, so I think that... People here, especially in Rio, people hear, oh, the party life, oh, it's great, da, da, da. And I go out and I'm like, mm, whatever. Like, I don't know, that's nothing for me. Like, I go to Lapa and it's like, mm, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that can feel, that can, cause sometimes it's like been there, done that with a lot and of that's probably more, And that's probably more what it is, because I am 45. So maybe I've, I've done so much partying in my life and, and I'm at this age where it's like, whatever, mm -hmm. like no big deal. So it could be that. <laughs> it no, could but be that. I, I've had a few people on the the podcast from Rio, and they all talk badly about Lapa. Nobody likes Lapa. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're like, you got to go at least once just to see it. Yeah. But yeah. then it's like, okay, whatever. And then you, there are other, better places to go, even in just in Rio. But, you know. Right. So I like that. And... Number eight, you're in Rio, so here, you can tell us, what is the best place to visit in your city? Oh my God, so um, I would say, so my favorite is going to the Apor Door in Ipanema, the rock. Mm -hmm. That's like the, my favorite, like the Ipanema, the beach, it's because you got the beach, it's amazing, you got the sunset, and the energy is great, everybody's like clapping at the sunset, and it's nice, it's amazing. Number nine, what, who is your favorite artist or band, you know, Brazilian artist or band? I really, really, there's a lot. I do really like a lot, but I love Ola Doom. I love Ola Doom. I love to hear their drumming. And that's probably because I, you know, started in Salvador really, really. And uh, it just moves my heart. <laughs> yeah, Doom, uh, those are the guys that work. On that Michael Jackson video, right? That's yeah. That's where they got international fame when Michael yes. was over there in very famous drum troupe. And 10, final question. Oh what my God, is, I'm doing it. <laughs> what is your biggest warning or advice for expats coming to Brazil? She's thinking, folks. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, cause honestly, I, 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 I really like what, uh, Elisa said. <laughs> um, are you, you know, stealing an answer? I, can't I am stealing it. an answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay. So, you know, learning a little bit of the language to be able to kind of get along, get around, um, go, don't, don't, don't stick to the touristy stuff again. Like. It took me a long time before I even went to the Christ statue and or, or Sugarloaf. Like, get to know the locals, go to local spots, bars, beaches. Don't just stay in Copacabana or, you know, the in, if you're in Rio or Baja, if you're in Salvador. Um, be around the locals. I mean, you're going to have a great time. Use common sense. Don't. Don't go out thinking, you know, like you're 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 in Europe or in the States wearing all this jewelry at night, using your cell phone, taking pictures because you will get robbed. You will get robbed. Like 
it's a reality. Um, you don't have to be afraid and be like, oh my God, you know, I'm scared. Just use common sense, um, which might not be common sense to so many people. Um, but like, go out, have fun. Don't be, you know, using all kinds of stuff to attract attention. Um, I dress quite normal. I, I dress like Brazilians. I pay attention. I notice my surroundings and I see how they dress and I dress like them. And then I, um, to blend in more. And if I don't see a lot of people on the streets, I'm not on my cell phone. Common sense. Um, because that's just asking for them, you know, somebody to come take your cell phone. Don't be in areas that's not well lit. I tend to take risks where I walk home at night. So if I'm out at a restaurant or a bar, I am going to walk 10 to 15 minutes by myself to get home, which is not something you should really do. Especially, um, especially if you're coming and you're traveling and they don't know you, they haven't seen you. I think because in my, my neighborhood, people are used to seeing me and knowing and they know me. I feel like I have less chances of something happening. So I'm not going to spend that money and take Uber to go home. But take an Uber, you know, um, don't be walking by yourself at 10 o'clock at night. And I have to really take my own advice. But what again, part of Rio do you live in? I forget, did, I, did you mention? I don't remember. I did. So I do live in Copacabana, um, which is not one of my favorite neighborhoods. I, again, Ipanema is one of my favorites. I do love neighborhoods like I've lived in Flamengo. I've lived in Laranjeras. They're a lot more calm and relaxed. And I actually do feel like they're safer than Copacabana. But um, because I live in a temple, it's cheaper and it's in Copacabana. And it's literally a two minute walk from the beach. So that's one of the things that I love. But um, my area, I do see at nighttime, there's a lot of crackheads on the streets at night. Um, It just looks completely different than it does during the day. Um, You do. Yeah, you do see a lot of the homeless people even during the day and at night. But at night, it's it's a little scarier at night. But I think because I'm used to seeing them and they kind of know me, I feel like I might be okay, but you just never know. Um, but it's a scary feeling to be walking around at night here. So I, don't, I definitely don't recommend that. I don't recommend it either. I've been to Rio twice and first time... I was there, I actually had to, I screwed up, and I went to this neighborhood called São Cristóvão to pick a friend up. Oh, yeah. This was before Uber, so then we just took the bus back towards where the airport was, um, or is, and the bus left us right in the middle of downtown, and we had to walk the rest of the way, and I said, oh, my God, and I have been in Sao Paulo. I've been in Praça da Sé, República, which are oh, like yeah, the rougher yeah. areas of Sao Paulo. Yeah. But I never felt this scared before. I was like, oh, my God, we need to walk really fast. It yeah. Just, there was this energy there that was not a positive energy, and I'm very in tune to energy of places, and I say, like, no, Me this too. is not a really positive energy. But then I went back a few years later to Copa. We stayed in Copa. I stayed with my sister there. And actually, I didn't mind Copa Pacabana too much. I thought it was nice. Um, and, but at night, yeah, definitely it gets a little bit more sinister. And we were like a block from the beach. So I guess I wasn't in Copa as far as the inside of it. I don't know if I'd be walking around in that part of it. But mm. Rio gets a little sinister at night, man. It does. It does. My and I think if you're on, if you're staying on that on that strip where the beach is, mm-hmm. like literally, I I felt comfortable walking at night on the beach. Um, not that you you shouldn't let your guards down and you shouldn't feel comfortable, but it feels a little bit more comfortable. But once you get inside more, then it's like, oh, you could see that difference. You know, yeah, you, you feel, feel it your that skin, on your skin. You feel it. it yeah. You know, funny, Renee. I was sitting at, at on a bench right in the, um, you know, inside the building, but in the courtyard area, I guess, talking to my sister. And we're talking, and it's like maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and then we see this little guy, little kid, maybe 8, 9, 10, run. And then be like 10 seconds later, it comes another little kid. who's maybe like 12 or 13. And then later, I think uh-huh. there's a third kid. And we're like, what the hell's happening? And then finally, like I'm like maybe 40 seconds behind all three of them is this dude like screaming, 
give me back my stuff. Oh, man. But then the funniest part about it was like Keystone Cops. Because about a minute after him comes the security, you know, like the police officer running after him. <laughs> I was like, it's like a scene out of a movie. So, right. There but I, I don't want to end on a down note with uh, the, 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 the scary stuff of real. Because one thing that you do need to understand about Rio, in most of Sao Paulo, I can't speak for all of Sao Paulo, most of Brazil, I can't speak for all of it, mm -hmm. is that, especially in the South Zone, people are looking to snatch your stuff. You know, sometimes we tell these stories and people are like, oh my God, I'm going to step out of the taxi and be gunned down. No, you know, people are looking to snatch your stuff. If you weren't you know if you kind of let your guard down a little bit and you got caught out there hand over your stuff that's all they right. want they want your phone they want the, your jewelry and they're gonna go away for the most you know 98 mm -hmm. of the time obviously uh there are exceptions the real rough rough stuff is when you go up into some favelas that maybe you shouldn't be going up into your that's where you see the guys with the AKs and this and that and the stuff that you see in the movies. But in the South yeah. Zone, yeah, it's mugging. I mean, that's basically what you're going to be Yeah, that's what's going to happen, yeah. yeah and I do have to say, it's so funny. I actually, funny now, but I did go into a favela and I did see a couple of AKAs. Well, it was interesting because I was on one of those motorbikes, motorcycles going up. Um, cause when you go into to the favelas, you can take a motorcycle up, you know, as opposed to walking. And I had my camera out, stupid, don't do this. Had my camera out taking selfies of me in the favela and guys come out, they come out with their big AKs. No, you are not allowed to take pictures here. And I was lucky that that's all they said. And I put my phone away. That was it. Like they could have taken my phone, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was very fortunate that that didn't happen. And I was like, Renee, that was stupid. Why would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> like I said, common sense is not always common sense. Cause you just get excited and you want to take a picture of you on this motorcycle going up through a favela. Don't and I think it's, yeah, they, so don't do that. So that's my advice. Don't do that. If you're going to go, go in a favela. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Because it's like the, the whole privacy and, uh, you know, it's run by drug lords and they don't want their pictures out there for good reason, mm -hmm. you know, so you just can't do that. But, you know, all in all, Brazil is safe. You just use common sense. It's a lot of fun. You're going to have a great time. You're going to have great, this great music. You're going to dance a lot. You're going to meet some amazing people, have some great conversations. The beaches are amazing. Food is great. So it's fun. It's fun. And... and so Renee's long. down here. Okay. And I'm down here. Come see me. Uh, so you can come see her. And before we head out, Renee, can you just tell us a little bit more about what uh, is on your Patreon channel and maybe on some of these other uh, pages, just a little bit more specific so people know what they're looking for and how to contact you? Yeah, yeah. So um, I had somehow become the uh, ambassador of Brazil, right? <laughs> so, so I was, um, when I lived in Salvador, I've done a lot of, um, I would always meet people and a lot of my work was, is, is just about empowering people. So a lot of my work is about empowering people. And so because of that, someone found me and interviewed me. So I was interviewed for Soledad O'Brien and I was on that interview in Soledad O'Brien in the U.S. And then somehow because of that, a lot of people watch it and I became the ambassador. So you can also find me on that interview. Check it out. It's really good, too. I'll link to and, it. Um, yeah, Black Rome, Black Rome Salvador. Link, link to it. It's really great. And it, it touches on my work with um, Tantra. So um, a lot of my work is bringing, I bring people from the States, women of color from the States to do healing work to become empowered. But in general, I work with people in general to just empower them. And that's through Tantra, through energy work, um, becoming more present, helping to help people in their relationships to learn how to improve the intimacy in their relationships, um, have stronger connections. And so then that led me to be on Lifetime, Married at First Sight, as a Tantric Couples Therapist, season 10, episode 10. And so... A lot of people are um, looking to me in terms of this work, this healing work. So if you go to my Patreon, 
Like you get a lot of this for really, really cheap. I have membership ranging from $5 to $50 and I'm doing a lot of things, self-exploration Sundays to really get you to self-explore, to learn who you are. I have meditation Mondays for the month of May. It's masturbation meditation Mondays where we're really going into masturbation and making masturbation more spiritual. And instead of, you know, just watching porn and masturbating, really just connecting to your body and learning how to bring in that, that spiritual energy into connecting to your body and self-pleasing. And then they have tantric Tuesdays. So we read different books on Tantra or we have discussions on Tantra. So it's really great. And then the rest of the week you get bonuses, surprises, um, on different topics about sexuality, healing, Tantra, sacred sexuality. So that's what you get. And then on my YouTube channel on Fridays, I have Red Lipstick Talk where we also talk about conversations, life, living in Brazil, different lessons, you know, with my girl Nefertiti, who I met in Salvador. But in general, my YouTube channel is about sexuality, um, Tantra. So check that out as well. Thank you. So guys, you have a lot of ways to reach out to Renee and she's awesome. I've, we've only known each other for like maybe four, five months and I felt her energy just pow, hit me hard. Just talking, not even vocally, you know, just on the, on the social media networks. So she's got a really positive energy. She can help you focus yours on various levels. So again, don't think, oh, this is just a sex uh, therapist or something like that. No, it goes right. way beyond that uh, to really get in touch with who you are. Obviously, sexuality is a component of that, but it'll really help you get to where you need to go. So I really suggest uh, you contact her, connect with her, and I'll have her back on the show if she lets me uh, <laughs> her back. If I'm on time. Yes, if you're on time. <laughs> no, it's all good. We just got we're not gonna set up a morning anymore. <laughs> I know, I'm tired of the morning. Guys that are watching the video person. know when I'm doing I think they figured out when I'm doing a morning podcast because I have the little hat on. Because my mm -hmm. hair is a mess. <laughs> but, all right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Uh again, uh Renee's contact info is on the screen, but it's also linked down in the comments, and I'll link some of those videos that she mentioned in the comments also. Thank you all for watching or listening. And until next time, and Renee, thank you so much for coming on. You were so awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. This was great. So Thank you for wanting to have this conversation with me and, and sharing this with your audience. Cool. Until next time, guys. Thanks for listening to the Brazil Expat Journal, the BJ you can trust. If you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and hit the little bell on this YouTube page or on whatever page you may be listening to this right now. And if you want to support this show, please consider becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash philray or heading over to my PayPal page. You'll find the links in the description. My next interview will be with Stephen Earls. He spent a year in Brazil as a student out of England and traveled more of the country than most expats do in a lifetime. We'll talk about his long voyage in part one of a very long interview. Also check in on Fridays for shorter BJs where I'll be breaking down some personal aspects of my Brazilian life. This YouTube channel, Phil in Brazil, also has a lot of other content like movie reviews, ESL lessons, my music, and even some UFO footage. Thanks and see you next time.